Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome, thank you for being here. Uh, and hopefully you're here for an introduction to cryptography. I mean, there, there is food, but uh, there is more than food. Um, my name is Xavier Belanger, and uh, I'm French, so there is an accent. Hopefully, don't mind too much. Uh, I work in IT. I've been working in IT for more than 20 years, uh, mostly on the operation side, uh, doing network and system administration, and more and more security stuff. I am a CISSP, uh, certified in security. Uh, I'm not doing security on my day job, but I'm involved with the security team quite often. And I've been uh, curious about cryptography more than uh, 10 years ago, uh, initially just out of curiosity, and then it became a necessity due to my work. Uh, that presentation is uh, version number four, version number five. The first version was, uh, I did that one in 2008, and uh, over time I tried to learn more and more about cryptography, about the history, about the legal aspect, the technical aspect, uh, everything that I can uh, put my hand on uh, that's related to cryptography, I try to to get that. I'm not an expert. Uh, I tried to learn a lot of stuff, but I didn't go through uh, an official curriculum to learn about that. Uh, there is a lot of resources uh, available out there. I uh, didn't put a full list, but I would probably post one on the Novalog mailing list. Uh, there is tons of books, of uh, videos, of everything that you can use uh, to learn about that. Uh, the slides are going to be available later online, uh, and uh, you can reuse that for your uh, own purpose as needed. There is a license for that. There is a lot to cover. Uh, there is a lot that I like to cover. Uh, we are still uh, limited in time, so uh, let's start. A little bit of vocabulary, uh, so just for people to, so just basically raise your hand if you're using cryptography in some way, shape, or form. Who is it? Exactly. That's my point. That's exactly my point. In this day and age, if you're doing any kind of activity online, you are going to use cryptography in some ways, uh, just because you're going to use HTTPS. If you're using SSH, you're using cryptography. Uh, there is plenty of other systems. If you're using a cell phone, if you uh, read a DVD at home, you're using cryptography. Everybody is using it. Most people don't know about it. Um, so that's just a little bit of vocabulary and definition just to make sure that uh, there is some of those uh, terms that may not be super common. Uh, cryptology and cryptanalysis, those things are very specific, so when you're uh, searching online, when you're looking for more documentation, make sure to use the uh, exact wording. Uh, if you're just using crypto, you will find a bunch of stuff. You really need to go to details for that. A uh, little bit of history. Uh, cryptography is almost as old as uh, uh, as soon as people have been able to write, they have been starting to find a way to say, oh, I don't want else to read it. Uh, so the earliest uh, traces that we know about cryptography are coming back from the antiquity. Uh, and uh, that's the most well known, but there is some other, it's also mentioned, cryptography is also mentioned in the Art of War from Sun Tzu, um, in China. It's also mentioned uh, in some uh, other books. It's even, there is even a chapter about that in the Kama Sutra from India. So it's, yeah, it's everywhere. Um, it's been used since uh, antiquity and then during all the Middle Ages. If you uh, read books about the history of cryptography, and some of those books are like good reading, um, you will uh, find that it's been used during the Renaissance, it's been used during the Middle Ages, almost every single uh, king and queen in Europe uh, have been relying on cryptography uh, for uh, different purpose, political purpose. Every army, every uh, war has been won in some way because of that. It's been everywhere. 
uh, during World War II, that's some. Uh, it was a really specific thing on its own. Um, a lot of uh, communica old communication were done by radio, and radio was nice because it goes very far. Everybody can set up the equipment very easily. And uh, it's real time, it's reliable. But the problem with the radio, it's broadcasting. So everybody can intercept it. So you don't want to speak over the radio and have anyone listening to you, especially the guy on the other side. So you need cryptography. And this is the reason why there was more and more cryptography developed uh, since war. It was already developed a little bit during World War I, uh, but especially during World War II because of the uh, all the distances everywhere uh, on in Europe, in Pacific Asia. And during the 20th century, we got computers. So that uh, cryptography uh, is uh, relies on mathematics, on numbers. Computers are really good with that. So that has been a decisive change for that. And not only computers have been uh, doing things more faster, more easier for everybody, but we also got new algorithms that have been introduced in 20th century. Uh, if you look at cryptography, and, and I will get back into that a little bit later, um, between the antiquity and 20th century, there is different things that have been used and different concepts that have been used, but in the grand thing, it's the same process that has been used all the time. And then we got brand new ideas, something uh, uh, that has been set during 20th century that has been changing everything. Very quickly, most people know about the Enigma machine. That's uh, the uh, German army was using during World War II to encrypt communication. Uh, army, uh, army, Navy, uh, they were using that all the time. Um, that is just an electromechanical device. So there is a little bit of uh, electricity used for some lights here. There is light bulbs under uh, those uh, that panel. Here it's exact. It works exactly like a typewriter. And here there is a plug board. It's not very visible on that picture, but there is a plug board to say, "Oh, we want to scramble things, so we're going to connect this and that." And uh, under that there is rotors, and this is what makes the cryptography system very uh, efficient, is that each time you pressing one of those keys, you're going to get a result. So let's say you're pressing P, and it will, uh, the letter T will light up. And all the mechanism inside the uh, mechanical uh, rotors will turn and shift, and then next letter that you type, even if you're typing the same letter, you will get a different result. Because it's a rotor, uh, at some point it will come back to the same position, but there is plenty, plenty of combination that are possible. Initially, people were thinking that's unbreakable. And it's like the Titanic. <laughs> it's been broken. It required a lot of effort from the Allies. Um, it, was, uh, it was a very long process, but it ended up being broken. Uh, <laughs> So that's also some kind of a proof that you can use cryptography to secure anything you want, but anyone who has a lot of resources, who has a lot of time and uh, some serious skill in maths can look and try to break your system. There is, no, there is one exception that I will mention later, but in general, there is no system that's unbreakable. So that's something that we need to keep in mind because uh, every time you're using cryptography, uh, you need to think, oh, what if it gets broken? What happens? Uh, you, you, you need to be aware of that. Uh, the system that we're using nowadays are pretty secure, tested and approved, etc. but uh, there is still a potential risk. Uh, if you want to play and actually play and touch Enigma machines, um, everybody knows the NSA, National Security Agency. Uh, they have their offices in Maryland uh, between Washington, D.C. and Baltimore. And of course, the NSA building, except if you're working for the NSA, you cannot access. But just next to it, there is the National Cryptographic Museum, which is 
part of the NSA somewhat. It's managed by former employees. Uh, uh, and they have uh, so a lot of stuff on display, including Enigma machines, including some that you can play with. You can encrypt a message on one and decrypt it on the other. You can actually see how it works. Um, you cannot change the settings, but at least you can use the keyboard. Uh, if you're going to the NSA museum, which I would recommend, uh, get a guided tour. Uh, if you visit the museum by itself, uh, it's, there is a lot of stuff to read and to, and to see, but if you really want to get everything out of it, you need to get someone giving you a guided tour. That's really uh, worth it, and it's free. Cryptography is something where there is a lot of stuff going on, and that's just a few things. Um, 2009, that was when Bitcoin appears, and uh, from Bitcoin we get other cryptocurrencies. I'm not going to talk about cryptocurrencies in that talk beyond here, for that reason that I have zero interest in, crypto in cryptocurrencies, like at all, I don't care. Um, cryptocurrencies are using some functions that are also used in crypto, but they don't have the same purpose. Uh, in cryptography, we know that we are going to use it for some specific goals. Uh, cryptocurrencies are here to manage the currency part and to make it uh, somewhat, uh, somewhat untraceable. But it's not really tied to cryptography. It's just that it happens to use some of the same mathematical functions beyond. 2011, we get the DigiNotar incident. DigiNotar was a certificate authority in Netherlands, and they were issuing, like uh, a lot of other uh, companies, issuing a certificate for your web server, mail server, teapot, whatever. And uh, what happened is, at some point, they realized that they've been breached. And not like breach, you know, oh, we get the list of your customers. No, they've been breached like completely. Uh, not sure if the guy were even able to access to their print server, but probably so. I mean, like everything. And what happened is the people who breached that company have been using their systems to generate certificates. So in some ways, fake certificate, because that was not a legitimate request, but on the other hand, it was real certificates from a real authority so that could be used and recognized everywhere without uh, raising any issue. Uh, more than, f there, there were not that much information given about that. Uh, the government, uh, the local government there just shut down the whole company. Uh, they went bankrupt almost uh, uh, the, the, the following days after the bridge has been uh, discovered. Uh, more than 500 certificates were issued, and it's probably not the exact number, it's probably more than that. Uh, but they were, uh, they were certificate issued for Google, for Yahoo, for all those big companies. That means that some people have been using those certificates very likely to intercept communication some other places. Uh, so that has been, uh, it, it was already known somewhat that certificate authority can uh, or should be trusted, but you can you cannot trust every single certificate authority. Some are poorly managed, uh, and that thing may happen. Completely breached. 2012. Uh, that, oh boy, that was a fun year if you were uh, managing servers. You got Herbly, uh, Freak, Poodle, Beast. All those names are uh, nicknames given to different. Um, uh, vulnerabilities for uh, SSL and TLS. And so that means that uh, your uh, system will need to be patched or updated or even replace a certificate. So all of those have been uh, coming up uh, like one after the other. Uh, once again, that shows that you need to keep your system up to date and current. And you need to be aware of what's going on uh, 2013, WannaCry, uh, other ransomware. Ransomware, like, I'm not going to say common uh, every day nowadays, but uh, a lot of companies have been uh, uh, 
affected by that. Uh, so people uh, realize, oh, if we encrypt someone's uh, data and uh, we need to pay, them, we need to ask them to pay for ransom, then we can get money easily. I, on the side, we can ask money in bitcoins because it's interesting. Uh, so more and more people are realize that, yeah, uh, cryptography is a good thing, but it can also be used for bad. Uh, 13 again, revelation from Snowden. Uh, it was already kind of known in the security community that yes, uh, the NSA is doing more than what is official mission on, on, on paper. And they've been uh, doing a lot of uh, extra activities, listening uh, to a communication or somewhat uh, intercepting in a way that they can bypass encryption. Um, the NSA has been also using some vulnerabilities uh, to uh, access uh, some other places. I, by core, I'm a, an engineer. If I find something broken, my goal is to get it fixed, not to exploit it. So. Uh, San Bernardino attacked in 15, so that's a, it was a terrorist attack in California, but as a result, at some point, uh, the FBI was looking into uh, the cell phone of one of the terrorists, you know, to find more details, more information, communications, etc. And that phone was encrypted. And, like, seriously encrypted, so the FBI and the NSA were not able to break into that phone. So what happened is the FBI officially, uh, you know, going through court and judges and all those things, has been officially asking Apple to say, uh, it was an iPhone, uh, uh, asking Apple about, could you please create a special version of iOS to upload on that phone so we can break the encryption and access to the information? And the uh, initial response from Apple said, we're not doing that because we don't want to weak uh, our security systems and we don't set, uh, want, want to set a precedent with any other uh, future government or any other request, etc. We are not doing to, going to do that. And there was some legal battle and a lot of uh, people have been discussing about it. What happened is at the end, uh, a third party has been able to help the FBI, uh, probably for a fee, uh, to break the encryption. So there was no, there was a long legal discussion, but there were no results because at the end, the uh, FBI didn't need to have the, a judge asking Apple officially to do those things and, and to comply. So, but that was a very strong discussion uh, a few years ago about that. 2016, let's encrypt. That was maybe somewhat a reaction after the DigiNotar incident. Uh, Let's Encrypt is a new, I mean, it's recent uh, certification authority that provides certificate for free for everybody. Um, and that's, the goal is to have, it's also in reaction to, uh, it's not in revelation, um, the goal is to have more and more people using cryptography, good, serious cryptography, and be secure on the internet. Um, before Let's Encrypt, you could get free certificate, but that only if you were in some situation, like uh, only for an individual, not for a, a private company, that kind of thing. And it could be only for a year. That, I mean, somewhat limited. With Let's Encrypt, you get the money barrier uh, disappearing. So uh, the goal is to get that uh, more. Yes. Yeah, certification authority can s are selling a uh, certificate for a fee, and usually it's not cheap. So that's also, uh, yeah. So that's not what I will talk about that a little bit later. Not necessarily, no. The goal was really to have uh, easier access to uh, certificate. 
And last, 2018, um, it was when uh, TLS 1.3, the most recent version of TLS, was being published, and this is now uh, what should be implemented to replace all the previous versions. Uh, just a quick word about steganography, because sometimes people are, uh, it's easy to make between what is cryptography and steganography. Steganography will not make your message unreadable. It will make it invisible. You can hide something between, um, uh, behind something else. And so if people don't see it, they are not going to pay attention and then it's going to be secret. But if people are smart enough to look behind the scenes, they are going to see what it is, plain text, nothing hidden there. Uh, steganography is used uh, even nowadays uh, for um, especially images and movies and stuff like that, so that way you can have into an image it's embedded. Yes. I'm going to mention cri uh, quantum cryptography at the end during the questions. I, I have some background on quantum cryptography, but it, as th this time it's, we're just going to do an intro about cryptography in general. No, it's a different kind of thing. They are hidden, but it's, on, uh, it's a different purpose and it's not the same thing. Yes. Yes. So that way, uh, spammers are uh, sending their spam message, but they're putting some other stuff around to fool uh, anti-spam systems. Somewhat crypto, uh, stagger yes. 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 Uh, it, it's, it's just that the border between cryptography and steganography, because it's in steganography because it's in plain text. It's also cryptography because if you have a pattern, then you may have a mathematical way to ca compute that. So it's just at the limit, but it's, yes. You don't necessarily, yeah. Uh, so, steganography is as old uh, almost as cryptography, so you don't necessarily need computers for that. I have a pretty neat example about steganography that I like, and you are going to understand why. This is a wallpaper for the Agence Nationale de la Sécurité des Systèmes d'Information, which is a French organization, somewhat they will probably not like that definition, but somewhat equivalent to the cyber division for the FBI. In France, that's the organization that uh, uh, is tied to the government to manage everything uh, IT security. And that wallpaper was officially published when they get that new logo. Uh, they were starting to use that everywhere. And they published that wallpaper and there was a, you know, a press release about, oh, we have a new logo, yada, yada, yada. And at some point, they mention, oh, some people may be, to be uh, interested to have a close on that logo. And uh, you cannot see that, but there is some stuff on the edge here. And except for, uh, except for that, uh, except for that thing on the edge, it's black, or it is. So that's steganography plus cryptography. There is uh, at least three messages that are encrypted into that picture. It was just a game. Um, it's not the first organization that did that. A lot of other organizations have been uh, publishing some kind of to have people interested into cryptography. Uh, one person did solve the issue not himself. It was, you know, uh, a lot of people have been looking in, uh, into it, sharing the results, and a lot of people get stuck because it was uh, pretty hard. Uh, one guy uh, get, got everything uh, right. It took almost two years. 
but it worked. Uh, if, uh, like everything else, if you're interested, I can provide you more details. The original article is in French, but Google Translate should do decent uh, work at giving you something in English. Uh, and believe it or not, I think that's the blue block here. I, I'm not quite sure. Uh, one of those messages is actually a memory file that you need to load in a game emulator and play the game to uh, get an answer. That's the French for you. <laughs> okay, legal aspect. Uh, usual warning, I'm not a lawyer, so don't take my word on it. You can use cryptography. That's Everybody's using it nowadays. Uh, if we were not able to use cryptography, uh, a large amount or economy would just collapse because we will not be able to transfer money and all those things. Uh, a lot of systems would uh, stop to have. But in some countries, you are not able to use cryptography. Not sure if it's a coincidence, but it's usually countries where you don't have a lot of democracy. So, uh, at the international level, uh, if you are Say tomorrow you're building a new crypto system, and you, you know, test it, prove it, reliable, good, etc. And you want to start uh, selling it everywhere. Internationally, there is the Wassenaar arrangement that will uh, going to stop you first. You probably need to get some uh, lawyer looking exactly at what you're going to do for that. The Wassenaar arrangement is the uh, legal treaty that is used for selling military stuff uh, everywhere. That's the same arrangement that will tell you, no, you're not able to build a tank and sell it to that country. Yes. That's the exact same arrangement. Yes. Cryptography has been tied to the military for a very, 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 very long time, and it's dual use. You can use cryptography for good and for bad, and it's really something that's critical for military to use. So it's governed at the international level by this arrangement. General principle on cryptography. On any IT system, your security is going to be at best where the weakest link is. When people are going to attack you, they are not going to attack you where you have the best defense. They are going to look where it's, there is a soft spot. So even if you're using cryptography to protect everything, if you don't have other good security measure, that's not going to help you that much. It's going to help you somewhat, but not that much. It's not, cryptography is not a silver bullet. You need to use cryptography on a regular basis. It's not like, oh, I have an important message, I'm going to encrypt it. I have a normal message, I'm not going to send it in plain text. If you're doing something like that, people will be able to read your regular messages, maybe see some patterns, and what happens if you send a message and after the fact you realize, oh, I should have encrypted, let me send it again encrypted. It happens, people are doing that. Uh, by accident, mostly, but it happens. So. The rule would be, if you encrypt, encrypt all the time. Everything, everywhere. No exceptions. There is a rule, that's the Kirchhoff's principle. Uh, it's a gentleman that was living in the 19th century, and he uh, wrote a small uh, book for military about uh, using encryption. And the principle is, your crypto system should be simple. Everybody should be able to use it. Everybody should be able to understand how it works. The only thing that you need to... So even your enemy should be able to understand how your cryptography system works. That's not a big deal. The only thing that you really need to rely on, that need to keep secret, is you get the same system for everything, but you have secret keys. So that way you need to protect only that and not the whole thing. Things easier. One other thing, uh, 
we have IT people in the room. I'm assuming that there is a fair amount of developers. But do not build your own crypto system. If you're not a cryptographer, don't do that because it's very tricky. There is a lot of traps along the way if you are trying to build uh, crypto systems. Yeah, the whole thing. Yeah. There is already out there a fair amount of tools, free and commercial, that are doing a good job. Uh, that you can use, that you should use. Uh, of course, you need to uh, do your due diligence and check that it's actually something serious. You don't just take the word of the vendor for it. You look for uh, additional references and such. But if you're building your own system, it, you're going to make some mistakes. Uh, there is a book that has been published recently uh, to uh, learn cryptography uh, and using Python for just, you know, the, the basic operation. And uh, the authors are doing a very good job about, oh, this is a bad example, bad piece of code. Don't use that. But they're showing you, actually, and they're explaining you why it's bad. Uh, not going to too much detail, but when you're doing cryptography, that means that you will need randomness, and you need good, serious randomness. Uh, you need initialization for some um, variables and that need to be done properly. You need padding and that need to be done in some specific ways. There is plenty of things like that that are implementation details that are not that much details that are really part of the system. If you have something like padding going wrong, that was the uh, portal attack. Uh, uh, see if I remember properly. Uh, stuff like that. So, what do you get when you are using cryptography? Most people are thinking, oh, it's going to be secret and it's going to be, uh, people are not going to be able to read it. That's the common definition that people have in mind for cryptography. To be really specific, you're going to get CIA, confidentiality, integrity, and authentication. Confidentiality, that means it's secret. People are not able to read it. Integrity, they are not able to tamper with it. You're sending a message, and the recipient will receive that exact message. Nothing changed, nothing modified. And authentication, you know that the message is coming from that person and not from someone else impersonating that person. There is also digital signature. Digital signature provides only integrity and authentication. Uh, it's used, uh, we're going to, to get to that, uh, it's used in a very specific context uh, to make sure that you just talk to the correct person and you're getting the correct data. Probably uh, said that already, but I'm going to repeat it again. Keep your system up to date. It's true in IT in general. Uh, it's especially true in IT security, and it's definitely true in uh, cryptography. If you have something from 10 years ago, I don't even need to look at it. I'm probably going to tell you it's crap because it's too old and uh, probably vulnerable to this or this or that. You need to have security best practices for all your systems. If your organization don't have uh, firewalls, network segmentation, patching, backups, all those things, using cryptography is not going to help you. be uh, part of the whole uh, security posture that you Key can be copied or stolen. Uh, you need to protect the keys. And in some situation, that means your keys are going to be stored on a system that's going to be offline. And I mean turned off, not just disconnected from the internet or, or, or not on the network. It's just shut down, offline, in a safe. Because some keys don't need to be used all the time. They just need to be used for some specific operation, time bounded. So if you are in that situation, you don't want to have those keys on the server sitting there, even if there is good security permissions. It's not needed. Take it off. Yes.
Yes, so that's something uh, that we are going to, to see, with, especially with security certificate. Uh, there is a time limit. In, in theory, the key by itself is not going to expire. A key is a mathematical number. It doesn't disappear in thin air. But uh, good security practices uh, are telling us, oh, after so much time, you should change your key. You yeah. must change your key. So that way, if someone is uh, getting a copy of it, then they will need to uh, re make another effort to get the new one. Mm -hmm. So there is some uh, uh, there is some specific algorithm uh, that you can use that will provide what is called uh, forward secrecy. That means that someone uh, is graphic uh, copy of your data, encrypted data. Even if you are, uh, they are able to decrypt one. Piece, they will. That doesn't necessarily mean that they will be able to uh, decrypt next one. But that's a specific implementation. It doesn't work for all systems. At some point, at, it's, yeah, at the keys. There, there, it's, there is, yeah. So, one second, one second, please. Not necessarily. It doesn't. It, it depends if you are having something sent long term or short term. If it's sent just short term, once it's received, the recipient receives it and doesn't need to keep it encrypted. Uh, but back to your question, uh, you need to change the keys because uh, that's good practice in general and that will uh, interceptions over time. Uh, we have algorithms that are strong enough that right now with no known vulnerability, the people, even if they have a long, uh, long amount of time to try to crack it, that doesn't mean that they will be able to do so. Yes. Uh, yeah, better algorithm, even sometimes better uh, equipment, but yeah. So, so there is something with. Uh, I'm going to get to that at some point with uh, certificates and public key encryption. The key you're going to stop using at some point. We will still be able to uh, decrypt messages. Decrypting is uh, if you have the, the key for that. Last. But not the least, National Security Agency, and uh, I'm uh, because that's the most well known. But that's not the only entity uh, doing cryptography. You have obviously the CIA and the FBI doing that as well, and plenty of other government organizations and the military, and some private organizations that are also dealing with that. Uh, and that's just for the US. You have plenty of other organizations that are doing that uh, worldwide anyway. So uh, depending who is do you consider that something needs to be protected against the government? If you're living here in the US, probably not. If you are a political uh, resident in some other country somewhere and you need to, you know, to be in touch with journalists and, and, and lawyers and stuff like that, you will need cryptography and need to have cryptography good enough to make sure that your local government, uh, I mean, you can get in trouble. You get the idea. So uh, we're using cryptography 
most of us are using crypto yes. to make sure that we our stuff doesn't go everywhere. Uh, in some situation, it's more serious than that. Something related to cryptography that people don't always consider cryptography, uh, ashing. Ashing is a way that you take a message and you uh, squeeze it to a specific string, character string, and it's a fixed size. It's not compression because from that result you cannot get back to the initial uh, message. It's a one-way function. It's a word cheaper. It goes in, goes out, but it doesn't go the other way. And uh, we need that because uh, some, we were going to see that a little bit later, some photographic function works well on small piece of information, not the whole message. Because if your whole message is one gigabyte in size, that's a lot to uh, encrypt or to sign, especially to sign. So if you can get something that proves that it's uh, uh, the same uh, um, data, then uh, it's going to be easier. And it's uh, for message integrity. M5 is SHA-1 is obsolete. If you have systems that are using that, replace those. SHA-2, uh, it's a family. Uh, the most well-known is 256. Uh, it's not the only one. Uh, that's the current common implementation. SHA-3 has been um, make official, it's, uh, it's official since uh, a year, two years ago. Uh, there is, it's not widespread, uh, not very well used yet, but it's going to be the, the next uh, thing. Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, those two are completely broken. Um, MD5 is broken, SHA-1 is broken. Uh, there is uh, people doing uh, research in that field and they're publishing papers about, hey, break it. And it's been multiple times, just not one guy somewhere. Uh, and SHA-2, there is few things, and that's the thing in cryptography, we don't wait until it's completely broken to get a new thing. We the new thing is developed before the, there is serious vulnerability uh, in the current one. Yes. What about the use of hashing simply to protect failure? Like checks, uh, yeah. So it's a basic checksum. No, because it's not as sensitive. Uh, because. We are in the situation where it's sensitive when someone is actively tampering with your data. If you're doing media check, you know, size download check, uh, good news, SHA-1. It, it's not the best. It's your only option, yeah, sure. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, some, some tools have, uh, are not supporting those algorithms anymore. Yeah. Okay. Symmetric encryption, that's the easy one. That's the one that is antiquity and that uh, everybody can understand pretty easily. Uh, you have one secret key. Uh, that key all the people need to uh, send and receive messages. And that same key is using to encrypt and encrypt. Video, also you how to set up and manage live streams. So and everywhere in cryptography where you are, so when you have an example, so it's Alice and Bob. Nobody told us why Alice want desperately to send a message to Bob. That's what she does. Room centralizes all of our live tracing tools into one easy to use destination. Cannot say that, sorry. Based on your feedback, some of which we'll walk through today. So, Alice wrote a message. She's using the secret key and she gets an encrypted message as a result. Then she can send that message to Bob. Whatever thing works to send that message, doesn't matter. Bob received the message, used the secret key, decrypted the message, and received the results. And if 
Bob want to send a message to Alice, it just mirrors the other way. Exact same thing. Easy enough? OK. And to be secure, to be, uh, etc., you need to have a very strong key, good algorithm, all of things. What kind of algorithm use for that? What one that you should not use? Data encryption standard, that one's old, that one's obsolete. There is a variant named uh, 3DS that is not fully broken, but if you can avoid it, avoid it. Um, the real uh, thing that everybody is using uh, as today is AES, Advanced Encryption Standard. Um, that's the name, it's a composed word from uh, the two name of the guy who created that category from Belgium. So that's a national US standard, and there was an international competition to uh, get a new algorithm to replace the ES. And those two guys from Belgium have been uh, submitting something, and they won, and they are now the standard for almost everything and everybody. There is uh, another one, uh, Salsa 20 Cha Cha, uh, that is another good symmetric algorithm. I know that uh, Google has, is pushing to use that one more and more, at least with Google Chrome in their own system. And there is the Vernum Cipher that's also uh, known as One Time Pad. That one is really special. That one has been mathematically proven as uncrackable. So that one is really neat if you want the most serious cryptography possible. But it came with a lot of uh, cons. You're sending a message. Your key must be as long as the message. Your key need to be truly random. And your tree key need to be used only once. If you're sending another message or the same message, you're going to need to use another key. So uh, in practice, it's not practical. It's used. Um, it supposedly be, was used for the uh, red line, the phone line between Washington and Moscow during the uh, Cold War. Uh, it was not an actual phone, by the way, uh, just not a landline. It was a more, uh, if, a, if you go to the NSA museum, you can see what it is. Um, but that one is, has been proven mathematically as, OK, you can get something really secure. But it's just that super knowing system to use. are the problems with that. In the first place, you need to be in touch with the recipient to give her or him the secret key. So if that person, that recipient is next door, that's no, it's no big deal. You can go for a coffee. Hey, here's your key. Up, you're done. If that person is on the other side of the country, how do you transmit securely a secure key a secret key to someone that you're not directly in contact with. Yes, an email. Yeah, no, <laughs> no, don't do that. So that's a problem. You need to be able. You need to. You already need a secure way, secure uh, in the cryptography sense of it. Your cryptography secure way to share the key for that person. Okay. When you have only two people, that's easy. You need one key. When you have 10 people, you need 45 keys. One for each, you know? Because you don't, I mean, granted, you can use one key for 10 people. But if one of those people is a bad person, everybody uh, gets screwed. So you don't want that. You want to have one key which in each individual. And uh, it doesn't scale. It just, at some point, at like uh, if you're in a very large organization, if at the country level, it doesn't scale. Uh, or the yellow book of uh, secret page, uh, secret keys for everybody, it doesn't, it's, yes. Uh, 
So that means that you're trusting the email system that you're using to protect your secret key. That means that you trust implicitly that Google and all of your employees are above any doubt. Or that they're not being breached or anything extra. It works, but uh, in the cryptography world, in the cryptography world, that's really, that means that you're trusting a third party. And that and most of the crypto system are thinking you don't rely just on a third party to provide you security. Also, yeah, there is that too. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, you send email. There is software for symmetric key generation and distribution, but the encryption rules and encryption link key is a lot more robust than the subscription key. Okay. Okay, now we're going to the new thing that is so. Uh, remember, during the I told you during the 20th century, we got a breakthrough in cryptography about new algorithm. That's what it is. Asymmetric encryption. From the antiquity to uh, the 1970s, people were using only symmetric encryption in some way, shape, or form. The Enigma machine that we've seen earlier, that's symmetric encryption. That's it. It looks super fancy, but it's symmetric encryption. That one is really neat. A little, obviously more complex. But you're not going to have one key. You're going to have a key pair. And the person who will need to send a message to you will use your, uh, see if you're the recipient, they're going to use their, your public key. How does it work? So, Alice and Bob. Alice is going to grab Bob's public key. And that key can be publi public, like everywhere. You can put that on a, on a billboard, that on a business card, Anything, anything works. You can put that so it's a, a, it looks like a long string of random numbers or something like that. Uh, but Bob can generate the keys, keep that for himself, and put that to the world. Alice can grab She has her message. She is encrypting. And once it's encrypted, Bob and only Bob will be able to read it. Even Alice will not be able to read that message again. Even she, uh, she has a key, but that key is only for encryption, not for decryption. So at this point, only Bob can use his key and get that. And of course, if we want to have Bob responding to Alice, we need to have Alice with a pair of keys. She is going to have a public key that Bob will get, and she will have a private key, and she will decrypt the message from Bob with her private key. I will, I will get to that, but it's, an, but it's a different, it's a different use case. It's, it's a different use case. It's only for a specific thing, but it's, it works both ways. But in this, in this scenario, um, the only thing that you need to remember is that Bob is the only one who will be able to decrypt the message sent by us. Yes. 
Yes. Any other questions? Okay. What are we using for uh, asymmetric encryption? The most common by far is RSA. That's the name of the three guys who created that algorithm. Uh, actually, the idea of uh, public key came from uh, two other guys named uh, Diffie and Hellman. And the history has been revealed uh, recently. Uh, some other people before them found out about uh, asymmetric encryption, but at the time they were working for uh, GCH GCHQ in UK, and that was top secret, so that was not public. Diffie have, Hellman have been coming up with the idea about asymmetric encryption, and uh, Rivest, Shamir, and uh, Adelman uh, did the actual presentation to uh, provide something uh, usable. That's the most common. Elliptic curves, that's another way, uh, and it relies on curves. Uh, so, not, so, one thing about cryptography that I like, it's involving a lot of math uh, in different ways, uh, different levels, and I'm really bad at math. Bad. I cannot imagine. Uh, it doesn't prevent me to uh, understand cryptography and to use it. Thanks, God. Uh, Uh, elliptic cryptography, it's something that will look like that, and uh, it's a very basic, simple explanation, but basically, when you have a curve like that, in a, you can have three points that you can use to compute something, and one, if you know one and the other one, you may be able to get the third one. don't remember exactly how it works, and I'm not looking into that. But uh, that's, uh, that's another way to have something computed to get secret and to use uh, with asymmetric encryption. LGMAL, that one is not very widespread. Um, it's a uh, algorithm, and the name is uh, from it, who created that algorithm. If you want to be famous, create an algorithm in cryptography. Your name is going to be everywhere. There is still some limits. No system is perfect. Asymmetric encryption is slow. Slow as hell. And it, you don't want to encrypt a large amount of data with that. You're going to, it's going to take forever. Even if you have good, decent hardware, it's still... You're working, uh, especially with RSA, you're working with very big, large, prime number. Massive numbers. And that's taking a lot of time. Uh, and it's slow. Uh, symmetric encryption is just basic mathematical operation. You can go uh, really, really fast. Uh, and uh, some processors are even optimized and have dedicated function. For symmetric encryption is fast. Asymmetric is slow. And gosh, we still need a way to distribute the key. Not to distribute the key themselves, but to make sure that the key is coming from the correct person. Or do I know that I received a key from John, because anyone can impersonate John? <laughs> so that's the problem, is if you have a key, you need to make sure that you're going to check the identity that is attached to that key, or the key is attached to the correct identity. So you still need to have trust somewhere. And now we're getting to uh, another step, that's digital signature. Digital signature is only about proving the authenticity, you're proving who you are, and you get the integrity. The message is not tampered with. But it's not secret. Everybody can read it. At first, people don't say, this like, you know, or putting a seal on the document. At first, people are thinking, oh, what's the benefit for that in the crypto system? We're going to get that. So everybody can read the message. And you're using the same kind of key. You don't need to have another system for that. The, sys the stuff that we've seen before, you can use that for... So, here we are. Switch the keys. Alice is going to use her private key 
to sign the hash of her message. She write a message. She's computing a hash. She's computing a hash because we don't know the size of that message, but it could be very long. And I told you, asymmetric encryption is slow as hell. So you don't want to uh, encrypt the whole thing yet. You just, if for signature, you don't want to do that. You want to sign it. So you're going to compute a hash that's small. You can sign it with the private key. And she's sending to Bob the message and the encrypted hash. Bob is receiving the message. The message is the message. You can read what it is, what it is that's no problem. We just need to make sure that it's coming from Alice and it's still the exact same message. It's not been modified in any way. What it can do is, from the message, it can compute the hash. And then it can, using Alice's public key that is available, it can decrypt the hash that he has received. And then there is a comparison. If the hash that is computing on his own matches the one that he has received, everything's OK. Everything's legit. And then you can verify it. that message is the through authenticated message. Is that clear? Yes. Because in digital signature, you're not protecting really the message. You're protecting the message to make sure that it's not modified, but you don't scramble anything into that message itself. So you're just uh, encrypting, uh, signing, using that for signing the hash because it's a small thing, and then you just attach the hash to the message. Yes. It's the same. Uh, we are switching the keys, and we are just and we are using ashes. But the, at core, it's the same. Yeah, it's 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 correct. Yeah, but we, especially for an introduction to cryptography, I just want to make uh, sure that people know that. Uh, you should not swap those keys just, you know, thinking, oh, I can use one or the other. No, no, no. There is a specific purpose for each key. Okay. Now we have, a, uh, we have symmetric encryption. We have asymmetric encryption. We have digital signature. So we can go to the real stuff, TLS. So TLS is what was known before as SSL. As SSL is completely obsolete. But everybody is using the name because it's so well known that every even company doing security are use, telling, oh, we're selling SSL certificate. No, you're selling TLS certificate. Love of God. So what do you have in a certificate? So first, a certificate is coming from the X509 norm. X509 comes from uh, X500. It's a norm uh, coming from telecoms about uh, directories and, and sharing information at, at scale. Uh, if you're using Windows Active Directory, that's something a little bit fine to make it simple. In a certificate, you're going to say, who has been issuing that certificate? You're going to have a unique serial number and some validity dates. It should not be used before certain date, and especially it should not be used after certain date. The subject is going to be the name of the server that is going to use a certificate, of the entity. Um, that example is really about servers, but you can use certificate for email or for code signing, of things. The subject is what is going to be using that certificate. And the subject has a public key. And you're going to put the whole public key here. But, oh, you want my key? It's there. It's my certificate. And the signature, the issuer, is going to sign all of this. And here we are. We have something that everybody can read. It's not scrambled or, uh, or unreadable. Everybody can read it, but you know where does it come from, and you know that's not been modified. 
So that's a digital signature that will prove what all good data information is. So when you have a, a certificate, a, a server, you're going to request a certificate from a certification authority. And the certification authority will work at different levels. They don't have one master, I mean, they do have one master certificate to sign everything, but they're not using that for day-to-day -day operation because that's really the golden egg. So they are going to use that to have an intermediate certificate and that one is gonna be rotated over time. Nevertheless, the request will be coming through uh, the CA and as a result, the, the, the CA will issue a certificate and prove that yes, you are who you are. So this is where some uh, certification authority are good and some others are not that good, is how uh, serious they are to check your identity. If you're claiming to be whatever business, they should at the very minimum look that this business exists, that you have an address, that you are registered with the state or county, whatever, that kind of thing. Uh, yes? So the request is gonna be when you're uh, setting up your server, you're se going to send a certificate request to the certificate authority, telling, oh, I have a key, I'm that person, and then the, after verification, the authority will say, oh, we're going to issue you this, and we're going to reuse the information that you've submitted. The only signature is gonna be the one from the issuer. Yeah, there, I mean, at some point during the process during when you uh, request a certificate, uh, depending on the CA, there is an option to sign your own request so that way they know exactly where those come from, but it's... Yeah. So the whole system is much more complex than that summary. Um, when you do that with a regular CA, you are filling up a form somewhere. You, even if it's a real serious certificate for a large organization, you may need to send some papers or they may be calling you, that kind of thing. If you're using Let's Encrypt, all that system for requests is gonna be automated with a protocol named uh, ACME, relying on HTTPS, uh, HTTP or so that you can set up some stuff on a web server or DNS server that you own and you manage, and so you can prove that you have access to And the uh, certificate issuing is gonna be automatic, which is really convenient. It's also one problem, uh, uh, I mean, some CA are moving a little bit about that, but uh, that whole process is still like very tedious, very manual. And also the problem is certificates are time bounded and more than once I've seen that people who forget to renew their certificate on time. One recent example a year ago uh, was a l fair number of certificates used by a uh, website government uh, government websites were not renewed because they was shut down. Shut down meaning no employees and also meaning no money. So nobody was there to use a credit card to get a new certificate. As a result, some uh, government's website were up and the certificate expired, it's dangerous to go there. Uh, no, le everybody can use Let's Encrypt. Uh, what is uh, the, the, the reason why some people are not using it is that when you purchase a certificate from a CA, there are also some other guarantees, like in a little bit like insurance, and some people want that. Let's Encrypt doesn't provide anything like that.
Mm-hmm. Yeah. There, for some businesses, some organization, there is a value to have more complete process. From a cryptography standpoint, doesn't matter. It's an organizational difference. So, how does it work when you try to communicate with a secure web server using TLS? Remember, asymmetric encryption is slow. You don't want to use that. Symmetric encryption is fast. You want to use that one. So, your client going to connect to the server and say, oh, I want to connect you in a secure way, and I'm able to use those algorithms because all the clients are not created equals. Some may be able to use the latest and greatest version of encryption, some other may just be your plain old Windows XP obsolete. Okay? And they're saying, oh, I'm able to use, you know, key of that size, or I'm able to use that algorithm, etc. And the server is going to respond, oh, hello there, here's my certificate, so that way you can check who I am. And I'm going to send along uh, something about, oh, we're going to use that algorithm. The server will decide what algorithm is going to be used. The client propose, the server to say, okay, we're going to use that one. And if that doesn't work, then nothing will happen if there is no ag mutual agreement between the two parties. So, the client will receive the certificate with all the information in the certificate. So it should check the date, it should check if the name is correct, it should check if uh, the uh, key is attached to a known CA, that's, you need to know if it's matching a known authority. The client should do a verification on that certificate and then will say, oh, oh, I have your, uh, public key, so I can send you something that you will only will be able to decrypt and say, I'm ready to, uh, to uh, give you something. And then the server should be able to decrypt that key and say, oh, I'm going to send you that back. And what happened here, people are using asymmetric encryption and certificates to prove to each other that they can discuss together, that they are in mutual agreement. And once they get that done, they can say, oh, I can send you a piece of information securely. Guess what I'm going to send you? I'm going to send you a symmetric key. And now we have a key together that we can use for symmetric encryption and it's going to be fast. So you have a lot of with the certificate, and once everything is verified, then everybody can go back to symmetric encryption and go fast. SSH is doing something somewhat similar. And if it's a long communication, then the key is gonna be regenerated every now and then. If you have a very, very, very long uh, communication, there may be even a, another check on the certificate to make sure that nothing changed in, in the meantime. But that's the beauty of TLS. It's a mix of symmetric and asymmetric encryption, so you get the best of both worlds. You uh, can check the uh, authentication, the, the identity of the server. You can check that it's the real person, that you're not, uh, nothing is intercepted or there is no man in the middle. And then once you get that done, you go to symmetric encryption and it just goes fast. No, it's the same. It's the same. They're just uh, computing something. Uh, there is a pre-master secret that is going to be, uh, yeah, in some ways there is two keys. One that's going to be for the agreement and then one that's going to be used. On. But uh, the, each side will have the same key because it's uh, symmetric. Okay, should be able to finish on a little bit of history. PGP was the first uh, cryptography software that was really popular. It's not, don't, I mean, Simon Tech, I think Simon Tech owns it right now and they're 
rebranded it, etc. I'm not going to say nobody's using it, but not as many people as uh, initially. The good thing with PGP, it was uh, people have get into cryptography because of that. What the first one free available for everybody to use, and it was when you know uh, in the 90s when people were, were using like uh, Intel 486, that kind of thing, like not super fast computer, not necessarily connected to the internet all the time, etc. Uh, on Linux and some other system, you can use GPG. It's uh, free, there is no patented algorithm, and it, there is an official standard named OpenPGP, and it complies with that standard. So, uh, if you want to do uh, cryptography on a Linux system, that's one of the go-to tools. The other one is going to be OpenSSL for certificates, but for such, it's going to be uh, most likely GPG. Something that is annoying with GPG, there is a very high number of options. As with most of the Yeah. And it's not super friendly and not super well documented. People are working on that. It's better than what it was before, but still. Uh, when you, uh, you have, yeah, oh, grandma, start using cryptography. Here's the manual. Good luck. Uh, and, and, and to be honest, that's one of the reasons why uh, some people are not using cryptography today. And it's also one of the reasons why people using cryptography are making mistakes, is because the tools are not super friendly. Uh, for day-to-day -day use, there is graphical interfaces. Don't ask me anything about that. I'm not using those. Uh, and uh, like any graphical interface, they're going to provide you a subset of all options. You're not going to have a window with all the possible options. You're going to just to have the more common, the more useful. So, yes. So Thunderbird. Mozilla Thunderbird is an email software, and so you would expect, oh, that thing should support email encryption. Natively, it doesn't. No, it no, it does with an extension name. Uh, yeah, but what happened is uh, it's going to be fully native this summer. There, so yeah, that's uh, it's, it's a change that's coming up. So right now, to get you know the full thing to uh, use uh, Thunderbird, we have an extension on top of it. It's going to rely on GPG behind the scenes, and what. Well, once again, uh, for people who are not that much interested in or not like, you know, computer friendly, that's not fun. Uh, hopefully, they're going to update that. So. Uh, some other tools, uh, some other email tools are not able to do cryptography like at all. Still happen. So, your email client need to be able to do that. Uh, some need an extension, some can do that automatically. Be aware, email encryption protect the message, not the headers. So that means that people looking at the metadata will still be able to realize, oh, you're sending a message to that person at that time of the day with that subject line. Uh, when you're sending emails also, uh, don't try to go crazy and say, oh, I'm going to encrypt your site. Um, One big exception for that is mailing list. Mailing lists are breaking encryption very often because the mailing list need to uh, republish the message on the behalf of the list and that breaks signatures. Yeah. Some system, yeah. Yeah, if you're, uh, nowadays when you're using uh, email, you're using multiple devices. So you need to make sure that you have s encryption set properly on all those devices, with same levels, same settings, same everything. Once again, not fun. Uh, I don't have the in mind, so. 
uh, key distribution is still an issue. You still need to be able to uh, provide keys to people in one way or another. One way to organize that, uh, some user group have been uh, doing that on a regular basis, is to do key signing parties. You could, yeah. And that one, it's a completely offline activity. You don't need a computer for that. You come, you bring a piece of ID so people can check who you are, like a you know, driver license, passport, whatever. Um, and you uh, bring a, a bunch of cards, like business cards, with your uh, public key. And you can say to people, you can check who I am, and here's my key. And you go around the room like that for everybody. And everybody can say, oh, yeah, I, I can trust you. I trust you a little, I trust you, et cetera. But at least I can trust you. I can see who you are. Yeah. When you cannot meet people, you can use key servers. It's not perfect, uh, but that's the system that, like, every system uh, installing packages, the packages are signed and they're checked against uh, the signature from the distribution. And if you don't have the key, the key should be grabbed from a key server. And if you're an organization, you can set up a PKI, public key infrastructure. Uh, when you're in that kind of situation, you need to make it slow. You need to plan for everything. It's not, it's not something that you're going to do in a week. Uh, you need to uh, think about, it's about identity management in, in general. What about, you know, new employees, employees who are leaving, who are, who are you know, kicked out of, or do you revoke the keys? It's, it's, it's a project in itself. Any questions? So I didn't mention, so that's true. Uh, key server vulnerable as a single point of failure. Uh, assuming that they are managed properly in the first place. Uh, no, I didn't mention that, but when uh, we, uh, give me a second here. Slides. Okay. When you have a certificate, at some point, you need to check for the validity if it's not expired. Checking for the date is really easy. You, know, you look at the calendar, you look at the clock, and what it is. But there is an extra step that is also done that I didn't mention at the time, is you can check if the certificate has been revoked. Not certificate has been revoked. You need an extra server somewhere to say, oh, here's the list of all the certificates that, that have been revoked for whatever reason. And if that server is not available online, what do you do? Do you stop sending stuff? Do you assume that, oh, it's just a glitch and the certificate is still valid? There is a couple of options. So yeah, first, a single point of failure. Um, revocation list are also Cryptography, you need to be serious about everything. Everything you do in cryptography, in IT security, it's already, you know, like a kind of not super fun activity. Uh, but in cryptography, especially, you need to go an extra mile like everything. That's what it is. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, uh, certificate transparency for people who don't know what it is, is the fact that the certificate authority will have a public listing about all the certificate that they have issued. Not the full certificate, but at least some information to make sure that, oh, this is what is going on. So you as an organization, can check that no other certificate authority has been issuing a certificate for your name coming from someone else. That's one of the benefits. 
you can check that nobody is trying to impersonate you and get a certificate, a fraudulent certificate for your name. Because any certificate authority can issue certificate for any names. They don't have technical restriction about it. If I want to impersonate Google and, and, and I'm able to convince a certificate authority that I am Google, they're going to give me a certificate for Google or whatever other company you like or dislike. So certificate transparency would be a way to say, oh, you can use certificate, uh, public certificate everywhere and then it's visible and then you don't need to set up your own certificate authority internally in your own organization, which is, again, not fun. There are still some organizations that are going to do that because you may not want to publicize the name of your internal servers or your internal, yeah. So uh, it's still needed uh, to have uh, internal certifi uh, certification authority. Also, when you're doing, um, you know, like email encryption or uh, issuing certificate for individuals, you don't want necessarily to have the list of all your employees who own the certificate to be public somewhere. So you still need, in some circumstances, you still need to have an internal certificate authority that you manage. When people on the network are doing deep uh, packet inspections, they're basically breaking the encryption because they own the keys for the organization. They are not breaking any encryption. They're just able to break the encryption that they are using for, that they manage. But in order to do that, you need to control all the keys. So. Yes. Uh, there is a, so I'm, I need to be good about that. Uh, and anyone feel free to remind me publicly on the list and shame me if I don't do that in a week. Uh, I, there is a bunch of uh, resources, especially for GPG. Uh, there is a couple of web pages that I know that have uh, like a good summary introduction. Uh, the man page is dry, but still a good place to start. Um, there, were, there was a good book that's a little bit old uh, from uh, Michael Lucas about that. It's, uh, the technical part is probably a little bit obsolete, like any IT book, but the concept in general should still be apply. Yes. Yeah, 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 I will. So, yeah, one other reason, in my opinion, personal opinion, one of the other reason why email encryption didn't take, uh, take off uh, is because people are using uh, web mails and mobile email client. If we were still back in the 90s, 2000, using desktop computer, you know, one fixed computer configured with, uh, uh, Heavy clients and SMTP, uh, pop IMAP, etc. You know, you have your email application. That's uh, something that you control and you manage and you configure. Then you can set up encryption. As soon as you start using webmail, you don't control anything about webmail. Everything is managed by the provider that you trust or not. <laughs> and uh, and once you start to uh, or also, webmail are uh, dumb oriented, if it's a thing. It's super simple. There is plenty of options in email that you don't get with webmail because it's, it's designed for the masses. So encryption is definitely something that was not on the radar. I didn't uh, get a chance to try something like ProtonMail that is uh, encrypted 
oriented uh, email provider. Yeah. So I don't know exactly what they set up, but it's definitely a little bit different than other other webmail. And yeah. Okay. So that's. Okay. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, you could encrypt a file with GPG to say, oh, this is my secret file, and I put my secret stuff into that. Uh, there were, uh, th we have some new stuff coming on. Now you can encrypt your whole hard drive. You know, when you install a system, you, most of the time there is an option that says encrypt hard drive. Because the hardware and the, the, the system themselves have been improved, so you can encrypt the whole hard drive and uh, not worry about only some few specific files. That's something that I would recommend. If you're looking at password management, especially, um, I would go beyond just having your password in a kind of thing. There is some password manager out there that are, in my opinion, way better and more. They provide more functions. Uh, one that I like uh, that I'm using is KeePass. And uh, it's you know capable, capable or generating password for you. Uh, keep an history. You can save some additional stuff like what's the security question for my bank, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So yeah. Yes. K Wallet. Yeah, that I've, I've uh, I have KD uh, running. I've start I've uh, launched uh, K Wallet a couple of times. I'm not using it, but I know that it's out there. Yes. Uh, GNOME has also something to manage keys. Uh, Windows doesn't. Yep. It's also, it's open source, and that's important in cryptography. That means that if you're experienced enough or you know someone experienced enough that you rely on, you can actually check the code and the code doing actually what it's supposed to do. Because, uh, and it's probably still the case, there were some software published uh, out there say, oh, cryptography. It's like, like military-grade cryptography. Yeah. Uh, if you're looking, uh, if you're doing a little bit of research, if you look for a snake oil cryptography, you're going to find a fair, that's, yeah, that's what it is. That's, that's, that's fair. Yes. Uh, nowadays, with, uh, I would not say nothing, but with uh, decent hardware, 